All right, you can turn your King James Bible to Matthew chapter 24. I said I was going to do this study and uh, been looking at everything that's going on. And, and of course, we have a lot of things to do with uh, living the way that we do off grid and then in town here at working and working and things. And so finally getting around to putting this thing out there. It's been keeping up with some of the news and whatever else that's going on with all the food distribution centers burning and airplanes crashing into buildings and, you know, with burning things and whatever else. Um, we're talking a lot about that today and the fertilizer shortages and all the other stuff that's happening. But uh, let's see about here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, that there shall, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now just let me stop there for a minute. Verse 3 is kind of an interesting thing because they're thinking, oh, this is going to be the end of the world. Jesus didn't say the end of the world. He's just simply saying the temple is going to get destroyed. He didn't give them any time frame about that. And it wasn't the end of the world, by the way, when it happened. And what preterists will do, preterists are people that basically say, to make it very simple, they say that all the events of Revelation happened in the first century, which is absolute stupidity and nonsense. I mean, we can see that stuff coming to pass, getting closer and closer to the mark of the beast and the whole Antichrist system and the New World Order and everything else, global government, in other words. We can see that stuff coming. So to say, well, it all already took place. I mean, you have to be kind of crazy and they had to believe it. But what they'll do is the preterist comes along and they say, see, Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. The disciples came to him and they said, when are these things going to be? And the, you know, the end of the world. And so there you go. 70 AD, it happened. And everything just kind of poetically, symbolically happened. Uh, no, I think Jesus knows the difference between end of the world and, you know, what was going to happen in 70 AD, you know. <laughs> so just wanted to put that in there because you'll, you know, these heretics will come out all the time and, and start to put little doubts into your mind and everything else. Uh, that's why I go after so many of these false prophets, by the way. But, uh, verse five, watch out verse four. Many are going to come in my name, you know, they'll deceive, excuse me, take heed that no man deceive you. There's a lot of deception in the end times. Verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. You say, well, who really comes out and you know, says that they're Christ? Well, you have Vissarion over in Russia, the crazy, crazy Russian Antichrist over there. You have, there's some guy in Australia named Brian, some old weird guy that, you know, uh, goes around saying that he's Jesus. You have some of these nuts that actually try to be Christ or whatever. But then you have all the Catholic priests as well, which official Catholic doctrine teaches that the priest is another Christ. And of course the, you know, Pope is also another type of Christ in the Catholic system. So of course they don't deceive anybody. The Catholic Church, you can trust everything that they do. Verse six, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Russia, Ukraine, possible China with Taiwan, and then going into World War III. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but their end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. It's just the start. The bad stuff hasn't even come yet. Well, that's something to think about. But uh, what comes right after the wars? Famines. Hmm. A little hard to grow food when you're bombing and blowing everything up. You know? And um, 21st century warfare. I mean, I've studied warfare ever since I was a teenager. I mean, I've always been interested in, in fighting and, you know, whatever else. And it's an interesting, I don't want to use the word evolution of warfare down through the centuries, but 
warfare has always been a very dirty thing and a very horrible thing and it's about destroying the enemy obviously if you just boil warfare down to the most simple definition it'd be about destroying your enemy okay you wage war on somebody you don't want to you know skip through the field holding hands you know chasing butterflies i mean no you're trying to destroy them okay that's ultimately what it's about but it doesn't always work open combat doesn't always work that's how so well you go into open combat with one of these a sword like this you're not going to be getting out of that combat without getting cut all right i mean if you're whacking and hacking and you're spinning around doing fancy maneuvers and you're you know whatever you're still going to probably get hit in the leg or the the arm or i know oliver cromwell the one time actually got hit in the neck got cut in the neck and uh he was you know a cavalry guy so that's pretty says something there but um knife fighting very similar you're fighting with a knife you're going to get cut you just kind of say okay i don't want to get hit under here or some kind of up in here or some place that where there'd be arterial bleeding gunfight there's a good chance you're going to get shot you know you see any kind of police shootouts with people the police are getting hit a lot of times you know you go into a combat situation whatever infantry you know ground troops you're probably going to get shot while you're shooting at other people so there's that just kind of the open warfare but then you have other ways of waging warfare which is psychological warfare is one that uh, the military has been using quite a bit and they and, then, and that goes back for many centuries you have knights coming into battle with all kinds of colorful symbols and you know lions and dragons and things on their shields what's that about that's psychological warfare very low tech version of it but that's what it's for you're trying to scare the enemy you're trying to make it look at me i'm bigger and more powerful and i have more money and i have more this and that well that is basically what psychological warfare is but what's another kind another kind is resource depletion if you can wipe out your enemy's resources be it their fuel their electricity and especially their food huh and infrastructure and things critical infrastructure and whatever else you can win the war you start to demoralize the people because there's no food to eat and then eventually they start to starve and their immune systems drop way down and they die and you get some guy who's you know not eaten in about two weeks or whatever else and he's wasting away and you know, lost about 60 pounds you know he's not going to put up much of a fight when the soldiers come into town so famine is a tactic of warfare and i believe that that's what's going on right now i mean you know all these plants burning down and everything else all across america we've had a couple potato facilities here in maine that have burned down and whatever and and which i understand i can perfectly understand why potato factories burn down because of how flammable potatoes are i mean you get a big pile of potatoes boy whew, don't you know light any matches near it it could just whew, catch up you know <laughs> i mean i saw some guy made a point about that he said last time i checked i don't think vegetables are flammable you know why do you have a food processing plant burned down and they can't control it and the uh, we lost everything all you know 40,000 pounds of food in one factory fire not joking uh 40,000 pounds of food just it burned up we don't know what happened couldn't stop it you know don't you have a sprinkler system yeah it does it, it wasn't working <laughs> what uh this thing's been being done on purpose to create a famine and you know it should concern you when uh, most of the world's leaders right now we're all trained by the world economic forum and all are uh, under the umbrella of the roman catholic control system you know when the uh pandemic thing started and the pope went snapped his fingers and everybody went and clicked their heels and did exactly as they were told lock down your population destroy your economy yes sir um roll out the hokey pokey get your people to take it yes sir you know we have world government so oh it's the good guys versus the bad guys america we're the good guys we're going to take down russia and putin and he's the bad guy he's the 21st century adolf hitler he's the bad guy and then you see the world leaders and they're all chummy in the you know g20 meetings and the g10 and the, you know the, the summit and this whatever you know smiling and shaking mm -hmm. yeah Next, let's go to uh, Amos chapter 8. 
I'm going to show you a different type of famine, which I referred to in my one video where we were went for a walk down at the uh, waterfall there. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. God sends the famine too, by the way. Um, if God is angry with the wicked, if God's trying to destroy people, he and he sends the famine, there's not one thing you can do to stop it. Okay? In terms of secular, the secular world, God sends the famine. But what kind of famine is it? Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I mean, how many videos are out there that cover this channel up and whatever else? And anybody that really preaches from the King James Bible, even the total heretics out there. How popular can you really get? I mean, I don't know of any real true Bible believer that has over 100,000 subscribers. I mean, look at all the channels that have been around for a long time. They're way down there, just a couple thousand subscribers. The fake ones with their little artificially inflated numbers, oh yeah, they'll get up in there and whatever else. But then they can't prove that they actually have that many real subscribers. You know, show us the silver play button there if you've gotten over 100,000 subscribers. They can't do it. Challenge them. But... Uh, what are people more interested in? Um, well, I'd like to see a guy playing a video game. That's entertainment. That's really important. I need to see how the, how the guy beat the certain level so I can beat it too. Uh, I'm a young girl and I'd like to watch makeup tutorials. I'm going to watch some ditzy little girl sitting there with a, a bunch of chemical, carcinogenic chemicals and seeing her smeared on her face. Just put it on lightly. Put your, do your lips next and then take a little liner. It's all toxic chemicals. Watch me give myself cancer. Boy, it looks pretty, doesn't it? What's going on? Oh, God sent a famine. God sent a famine. Got a lot of people offended not long ago when I did my study about Jesus doesn't save you, the Bible does. I mean, you know, if it's all about Jesus and you don't have to worry about the written word of God, why does it say there, but of hearing the words of the Lord? Why doesn't it say, but of hearing about Jesus or something? <laughs> People don't care about this book. This is a birthright here. Like Esau despised his birthright. This is our birthright, brethren. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This is your birthright. Ah, I can take it or leave it. King James Bible is an okay translation, but uh, I'd prefer the ESV or the whatever, or just the Greek or the Hebrew. I just, you know, you despise your birthright. And you might want to read what the Bible says. I know the, the Bible, uh, I can't use that as an authority. I get it to, in these warped people's minds. But the, what God thought about Esau, Esau that despised his birthright, God hated him. Oh, he hated the sin. No, he hated Esau. That's what the Bible says. Verse 12, let's keep reading here. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. And they, sh they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. You realize what's going to happen when Internet 2 gets kicked in? And I am gone. No more Brother Brian, no more KingJamesVideoMinistries.com. You know, and I mean I'm gone off the Internet. You know, Lord decides to preserve my life or whatever else and I'm up here running around you know in the wilderness off grid or something like that be kind of nice actually sometimes I'd <laughs> like that but I'm going to be here online as long as the Lord wants me to be here but the time is going to come when the Lord's going to look and say you know what um, these people aren't worth me feeding them with the word of God anymore so all my faithful preachers be quiet. Have you been seeing that with your personal witnessing? How are the opportunities going with getting to witness to co-workers and whatever else? I'll tell you right now, there's very few anymore. He used to pray, you know, Lord, I'm going out in public here. I'm going to go to the store, whatever. Lord, please give me chances to witness to people and please open up some divine appointments and whatever else. And I'd get them. I would get them. I'd get to witness to people, share the gospel with people. I've had Lots of those. Just total random stuff. I'm not even planning it. And, you know, I don't look at somebody and say, <clears throat> okay, here, 
That's the guy I have to witness to him. Okay, here we go. Okay, get a gospel tract. Oh, yeah, I have a gospel tract in here in my pocket now. All right, here we go. Uh, hello, sir. Can I please give you the... Not even like that. Divine appointments Lord used to give me. Just out of the blue, somebody start talking to me about the Bible or about, yeah, I don't know where I'm going to go. When you, you know, I, I don't know what you believe about heaven or hell or whatever. I said, well, actually, I'm a preacher. Oh, really? Well, what do you believe about... You know? And away we'd go. Or, hey, let me carry this out to the, your, your vehicle there. Oh, I see the bumper magnets on your vehicle there. Are you a Christian? I can't tell you when the last time that happened was. What's going on? Um, the famine's starting to increase. That God is sending. You see, God is so angry with these wicked people out there right now. He's saying, I'm going to cut these words off from your mouth. You're going to be going to your church building and you're not even going to care about this blessed book. You know, let's bring back America. Let's fight for America. How are you doing it without the power of God's pure word? You've been disarmed. You're going into battle with a plastic sword. Has no power at all. There's no power. This book here puts fear into the hearts of devils. The NIV, they laugh at it. It's a joke. But all these people, you know, Oh, uh, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. These people come out and they, well, I'm a Christian too. And I, you know, and there's no power. Why? Because God's starting to remove his word. Well, you don't want my book? Well, okay, I'll just kind of get that out of the scene. He's sending a famine in the land. And you know what disgusts me more than anything else? When I hear of people that used to stand for the King James Bible, and now they don't because they had to compromise to go along with the world. Well, the people at my church, they don't use it, so I didn't want to make problems. I, I just, you know, my family members, they were kind of a little upset about some of my militant stance. I, I backed off. You know, I don't think it's that important of an issue after really looking at it and praying about it. You know, you didn't pray about it. <laughs> Give me a break. God's just going to say, yeah, you know, martyrs died for this book, and this has been the most blessed book ever in history. But eh, you can take it or leave it. It's up to you. Genesis chapter 12. Show you the first famine mentioned in the Bible. Genesis chapter 12. Back to the beginning, first book of your Bible. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. You know, you say, why'd you read that? Okay, it's an interesting thing, first famine and whatever else, because there's a very important thing there. Um, Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Um, you might have to move. You might have to geographically relocate. I don't know how's it going to hit, how, where are certain areas going to be really bad. And quite frankly, I think it's going to lead into war in this country when the food in the grocery stores is gone and people start to get hungry. Uh, it's going to get very violent. I firmly believe that. Everything that's led up to this, it's going to end very badly. And uh, I would get away from populated areas if you can. If you can't, well, pray about it. The Lord can get you through. We'll be covering those scriptures here in a little bit. Uh, don't lose hope, but um, the Lord might uh, he might be having some, some future plans for you to move. I don't know. The uh, Lord might have them for me. There's some things I'm frustrated about with our living situation and whatever else, and, and I'm just, you know, Lord, I don't have time to build this or do that, and, and, you know, what should I do here? And I'm not really getting many answers to, pray, or to my prayers. Uh, the Lord might have some plans for me to move, for us to move my wife and my son and myself. Um, maybe that's there. And you know what? If there's no food in the land, uh, you don't really have much of a choice. You will be moving or you will be dying. Be open to that. What the Lord wants for your future. Go next to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. 
verse 25 through 32. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. In other words, Pharaoh had more than one dream. I think he had two dreams there, but he says it's just one. It's basically the same thing said two different ways in your dream. Verse 26, The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Hmm, I wonder how many of our leaders know what all is going to be happening. God might be showing them. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God may kind of possibly, you know, do it if he wants to, if, you know, if he's in a good mood or bad. No, it doesn't say that. And God will shortly bring it to pass. Well, I believe that uh, we've had some pretty good years where people could get their nutrition figured out. Um, understand what foods are good for you, your particular ethnicity or whatever else. Understand what really makes you feel, you know, good and healthy and whatever else. Um, that's important. Stock up on those foods. Make them a part of your life. Can you buy things locally at local farms? Can you forage for food? Can you hunt? Can you fish? Can you raise a gar you know, fruits and vegetables in a garden? Can you raise animals? Um, figure that stuff out. We've had a lot of time to do that. Unfortunately, that time is ending. Uh, this summer might be the end of it. I don't know. I've heard different accounts. People are saying, I think we'll have enough food for six months, which would put us into October. Maybe before that, I don't know. It could be a very bad winter coming up. Um, do what you can to stock up and whatever else. You say, well, Brother Brian, I, I'm not able to. There's just no way I can do it. I don't have the money. I don't have this or that. Well, like it pretty grievous, as the Bible says. Psalm 33. I'll show you some verses of comfort with famine looming on the horizon and I don't say that lightly I'm not joking around you know I have a weird sense of humor if you've watched me for a while you know that um, but uh, I'm not joking on this one okay I will be laughing throughout the study because that's I have the joy of the Lord in my life but uh, when it comes to being serious this thing is beyond serious um, I think it's going to get very bad in America and most other countries as well. Unless you live in Russia, I think they'll be fine there. <laughs> Psalm 33, verse 18 through 22. If you can get to Russia, it probably would be a good idea. Um, I wish I could get there in some ways, but, you know, with the way the flights are and everything right now, not happening. Psalm 33, verse 18 through 22. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. He's watching you. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. Let Thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in Thee. Do you have hope? I hope so. Uh, we're supposed to have hope, brethren. And if you're righteous, if you let God refine you, if you've seen the last study, God can refine that sin out of your life. And now the Lord can preserve you, even in famine. As we read there in uh, verse 19. Now let's go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verses 18 through 22. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Not just provided for, not just, well, I had enough, you know, I have a little few rations here, a little 
thing of oatmeal and I'm still really hungry. All no, they'll, you'll actually be satisfied in the days of famine if you're righteous. You're putting your hope in the Lord and whatever else. It's pretty good. Verse 20, we say, well, then why would God bring a famine to the land? But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. Uh, okay. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. Federal Reserve, yeah. But the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. Hmm. Now we might see a lower little example of this. I mean, we're not in the going into the thousand year millennial kingdom. I get it. We're not going to have that level of inheritance, you know, being uh, blessed with, you know, inheritance on the earth and things like that. But we might see a small example of that. I mean, if you think about the wicked people in your area, if they're cut off and you're left, will there be some nice assets out there that you could probably obtain for very cheap? Yes, if the Lord gives you those things and says, okay, hey, you need some of this, you need that, there you go. Hmm, might not be as bad as you think if you hope in the Lord. Very important there. But I find it interesting there, verse 21, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. <laughs> you know, what a statement. But the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. Well, how much should you give I think that that's a big thing here. Let's say that you have some food that you're stocked up with and whatever else, and the wicked start to come around and, and things. Um, I have a really hard time saying that anybody in America is poor. Uh, I realize that there are people that are poor here in America, but for the most part, um, I was changed many years ago. I went to Honduras, and I went there twice, actually. Or no, I'm sorry, Costa Rica twice, Honduras once. Um, my Parents went a couple times to Honduras, so. But uh, I was there in Honduras. I was in one of the small little villages. La Asequia was the village name. And went there and I saw poverty. People with dirt floors. Newspaper taped together for walls in their little stick hut that they were living in. Um, people that if there was any kind of a flood that would come down the river, it would just wipe them out like it did with Hurricane Mitch. A lot of people people lost their homes. A lot of people lost their lives. Um, seeing children barefoot, little small children walking around, no diaper on, just nothing on down there. Maybe a t-shirt on up top or something like that, dirty and whatever else. Meeting children that had been homeless and been cast out by their parents and things. I saw it. I saw it. And I come back to America and there was this guy walking around the airport and he had gold necklaces on and oh, I'm, I have these problems and things. Please help me. And and, you know, he's brand new shoes, brand new clothes. I'm poor. I need money. Please, he's begging for money. And I just, buddy, you don't know where I just came from. I just saw real poverty. So here in America, real poverty, eh. Uh, more like people who have just basically made themselves poor through many years of building up debt. Uh, they've gotten to the point where their liability lifestyle has just destroyed them. Oh, I'm so poor. Please help me. Please help me. Uh, these people come to my door. They're not going to be given much help from me. Um, not a whole lot. Uh, I don't really have time for people like that. If there are people that are genuinely, that have had some bad things happen, say some family, they were prepared and people came, stole everything from them or whatever else. Okay, I'll help them. But uh, the average person just not preparing for anything, using profanity, drug head, you know, whatever. Hey, I need some. I need some money, man. Why? Are you going to go buy cigarettes with it or some alcohol? You know, be careful who you give to when things get bad. Is what I'm trying to say. Next, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 20. Oh, wait, no. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 10. Excuse me, I was looking at another place there. Jeremiah 14, verse 10 says, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. 
They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. A lot of people here in this country, they love to wander. I mean, you know, even back when I would preach in pulpits and churches, I'd see I'd be up there and just pouring out my heart and soul, you know, trying to, you know, lift this book up and and trying to get people to understand what the Bible says and whatever else and uh, you know the nearness of the end times and whatever. And I'd see people get saved and things. They'd come forward afterwards or whatever. But I'd see the other people just. You know, and look over and see somebody that they hadn't seen in a while. You know, what are you doing? Do you, do you even care what I'm saying? Your your mind is wandering right now. That's what a lot of people do, and uh, it gets to the point where the Lord says, "Okay, um, time's up. My grace is no longer there. America, I've called you to repent over and over again, and you're not repenting. You're still doing this wicked stuff." I've given you chance after chance to get right with me. Now the axe is going to fall. Verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. Let's have a national day of prayer to, to God save America. Don't, don't pray anymore. Please don't pray for God to bless this nation. You see somebody saying, Well, let's pray for God's blessing to be upon this country. I don't think you should anymore, quite frankly. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Notice the, the unique three-part program there. The sword, war comes. It destroys the people. They can't plant crops. They can't go out and get food. Famine comes after that. Your immune system goes down because of malnutrition. Then comes pestilence. Pestilence comes, by the way, as a result of malnutrition. It's not some kind of genetic thing or whatever. I have some kind of special disease because I was born with it or something. I, uh, uh, unless there was some malnutrition there. Um, your genes are produced by good nutrition. If you have bad nutrition or your mother had bad nutrition, well then, yes, you might have been born with some nutrition issues, but the fact of the matter is you can correct that. The body is regenerative. That's why you lose your cells. The dead cells fall off and you create new cells. All right. Uh, I realize you get older and you know you start to get gray hair and certainly, sure, you know, most of mine's from stress, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, you can regenerate if you have the right nutrition. And very high levels of nutrition, you can regenerate a lot of things, bones and your eyesight and whatever else, um, if you have really high levels of, of nutrition. But my point is, famine comes in, your nutrition level starts to go down, and you start to get sick. You have uh, immune deficiencies. Hmm. I won't name any of those. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 13. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. I mean, the prophets nowadays, yeah, you have the false ones in the church buildings, but you also have the people in the news media. You know, things are looking up. Everything's getting better. Strongest economy ever. You know, the whole thing. They're just lying. Verse 14, Then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination. That's interesting. And a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. The heart is just desperately wicked. Out of the heart proceed all kinds of evil things. The Bible talks about that. What are these people doing? They have covetousness. They don't want to see things get worse. We're going back to good times. In fact, we're going to better times than we've ever seen before. Sure, all of our industry has been shipped overseas. And sure, we don't, you know, we have huge unemployment rates and lots of Americans that are homeless and we have diseases that we can't cure and whatever else. And sure, but it's getting better. They want to say that because you can keep sending your money in then. Keep tuning into your favorite television uh, <clears throat> programming. 
You know, it's insane. Verse 15, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall these prophets be consumed. That'd be a nice thing. All these false prophets, all these media personalities and everything else. And they'll be consumed by the sword and famine. They'll perish. I mean, if we have some grid down situation, who's going to care about some television personality? Uh, this is, you know, so and so with Channel 8 News out here covering the first thing. There's no electricity. What are you doing? We have a grid down situation. Our country's at war. There's killing and there's all kinds of bad stuff. Food is gone and whatever. Shut your stupid camera off. It's, the news media is not coming back on. <laughs> kind of funny if that happened that way. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters. For I will pour their wickedness upon them. I think we're going to see that, brethren. I think it's going to get to that point in time where there's so much death and dying that there's not going to be enough people to bury them. It's like what happened in Nazi Germany. You know, the crematoriums, you know, the, these anti, you know, the Holocaust deniers, anti-Jew, you know, papists, they come out and they say, oh, you know, this whole thing of, of uh, Hitler and what he did over there, that, you know, the modern crematoriums, they can only cremate um, one person every half hour or something. And they were, they were saying that the Nazis were cremating, you know, all these people and whatever else. And I pointed out one in my, my one study and I said, I point out the fact here that, that uh, I don't think the Nazis cared about doing it in a way to not upset the families. You know, <laughs> they're just trying to get rid of bodies. You know, I mean, obviously, if you take your loved one into some crematorium someplace and they say, oh, by the way, just to let you know, we're going to be stacking about 12 other people on top of your grandmother and we're going to burn them all at once, okay? Uh, we'll just kind of mix all the ash together and give you the little thing there, a little urn deal. And there you go. Is this my grandmother's ashes? Well, partly, you know, her and, you know, 12 other people. Well, they aren't going to do that. So that argument is another one of the stupid things that these Holocaust denier guys come out with, you know, and whatever. But uh, they were trying to get rid of bodies over there in Nazi Germany. They were killing so many people that they were having a problem, a logistics problem, with disposing of corpses. What's it going to be like here in America? Military website years ago, 75% reduction by 2025 in the population of America. How are the 25% going to bury the 75%? I mean, if that number's true, it's their plan. Could it happen with famine? Could it happen with war? Could it happen in a grid down situation? No idea. Finally, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So I don't like how this whole sermon is stacking up here, brother. It's kind of a little scary. Not real good news. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's the spirit of prophecy. Uh, not very good news. All right. Um, it's good at the end, but uh, getting to the end is the problem. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or... Famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. I just don't understand. I remember hearing the sermon that Brother Brian preached way back there in late April. And he talked about famine that's coming. And I did my best to get prepared, and I still went into it here and whatever month that comes in the future. I went into it, and uh, we ran out of food, and, and we're dying. Our child just died and, and everything else. I guess the Lord doesn't love us anymore. That's not what the text says, brethren. It's not going to separate you from the love of God, the love of Christ, if you go into famine. Can God spare you? Yes, He can. But He might choose not to. He might say, hey, you know, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of His saints. Is the death of His saints. That might be the future. Verse 36, 
as it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. One of those uh, verses in the New Testament that uh, modern church people will never talk about. Martyred for Jesus Christ? Are you kidding me? <laughs> the only group that modern church people really truly hate are uh, Bible thumpers. I've known them for years. These people, modern church people. They get along with everybody. They want to make bridges, build bridges with everyone. Oh, you're Muslim? We can be friends. Oh, you're a sodomite? We can be friends. Catholic? Oh, hey, I, we have a lot in common. You know, I've seen these people. I know these people. Oh, you're into witchcraft? Oh, that's wonderful and, and everything else. Wait, you believe the King James Bible? And you believe in dressing modestly as a, as a woman and you're against this and against that? And you'll see a spirit coming out of those people, those uh, churchy people. They hate you. Why? Because they avoid verses of Scripture that talk about dying for Jesus Christ, a truly changed life. Modern church people hate the thought of being a new creature. They want to live in their old sinful lifestyle and not ever give it up. Verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The stand that you take as a Christian, if you truly understand this blessed book right here, your standard as a Christian is, not my will, but thine be done. God, whatever you do to me, I know that you love me enough to die on the cross to pay for my sins. And that right there is enough. If you kill me after you save me, if you let me be slaughtered, I die as a martyr. Hey, that's enough. I'm born again. I know where I'm going to go when I die. No matter how bad it gets, Lord, if, if there's some purpose in my death, that you can be glorified by my death, okay. Or if you want me to live, if there's some reason that I need to be here on the earth after the famine or through the famine or whatever else, then Lord, please preserve me. I'm hoping in you. I mean, think about the, the just logical scientific system here for a minute, okay? Uh, there's a famine coming. Is that logical? Is that scientific? Yes, we can see proof. It's, it's you know, clearly there, scientific proof that you know, you can't have food factories burning down and losing tens of thousands of pounds of food and say, everything looks great. You know, that's not good. The fertilizer thing, the oil shortage, you know, that they can't make fertilizer, that's kind of a little concerning too. You know, we, we're having an oil shortage, so we can't make fertilizer to grow our crops better. So you're using, you know, oil, petroleum-based products to make food grow, that's a little bit nuts, but also, you know, you have the, the fuel shortage, which leads to diesel prices rises and whatever else. So you have farmers saying, hey, I can't afford to drive my big, huge, you know, tractors out there and do the fields and whatever else. And most people are too lazy now to actually go out and work on the farm by hand, you know, so that doesn't work. But um, you have all of those things there. And, you know, you can look at that and you can say it doesn't look very good. It looks a little bit bleak here. I totally forgot the point I was trying to make there. <laughs> Nothing but the most professional here. I mean, I've been trained in seminary for many years to do a great homiletical, you know, speech and whatever else. And Or I should do these, you know, I see these videos on YouTube all the time. Every couple of seconds it's cutting and they're, you know, it's edited and whatever else. The guy can't talk for 10 minutes without, you know, having to edit out mistakes that he's made. I just leave them right in for you, you know, just so you can understand what I'm all about. <laughs> okay, I know what I was going to say. Lord brings it back when he can get it through the thick skull up here. We know that a shortage is coming. You stock up. You say, you know what? I'm going to drain my bank dry. I'm going to go out. I'm going to get all the survival goodies, everything I can get, MREs and, you know, all the different things out there that are, not really worth eating all the preservative stuff and but I'm going to get dried beans I'm going to get oatmeal I'm going to get uh, uh, whatever pasta and 
all these different long-term storage foods. I'm going to have dehydrated foods, whatever else. And are you secure? No. That stuff can be stolen from you, number one. Number two, there could be a fire and you lose all of it. So what are you left with? My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. Old hymn. That's really where it has to be, brethren. I can tell you, you know, hey, seven years of plenty, stock up for the seven years of famine. There's some biblical wisdom there. Rational, logical thinking. Hey, you might want to get a few extra things of food. Make sure that you have about a month's supply just in case. I mean, just stuff that you normally eat. Um, that's some wisdom there. Fine, not a problem. But ultimately, it has to go back to your hope being in the Lord. And say, okay, God, there's some sin in me. Help me to refine this out here before times get much worse. Um, and Lord, I'm ready to go home at any time. That's the standard of a Bible believer. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I gain if I get killed in what's coming, if long as I'm doing it for the Lord, okay? Um, so, very important thing here, brethren, because a huge famine is coming. Why? Um, because I've seen the stories and the conspiracy sites are off the charts talking about this. Uh, well, that's there. But um, my Bible tells me that a famine is coming. My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said that a famine is coming, along with war. You better be prepared for it, brethren. Um, so I think that's going to be it for this study. Um, something to really pray about as we go forward. Hope in the Lord. All right? Um, so I'd like to hear people's thoughts. You can write in the comment section down there if I've missed anything and whatever else. If you want to add some extra thoughts and whatever, extra, extra scriptures, I always appreciate that. So thank you to everybody out there that has written to us and, and uh, that supports this ministry. Thank you for that. Uh, we really do appreciate that. And uh, we will see you in upcoming studies. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.